Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Manchester Is Red podcast. It is nearly as cold in this studio as it was at St James's Park on Saturday night for what was a miserable night for those who had travelled from Manchester to watch Manchester United at Newcastle United. I was there along with my colleague Samuel Lockhurst. Samuel, how are you today? today? Not bad, not bad, thank you. Yeah, uh, Ready to get stuck into a, another, yet another inquest. In this, yes, uh, we'll uh, we'll get straight on and uh, inspect the corpse and see um, see what's left. Uh, I mean, it was on the face of it, one nil defeat to Newcastle is is not a disastrous result. I mean, Arsenal lost one nil there, Chelsea lost four one there. They've got a phenomenal home record under Eddie Howe, but it was a one nil thrashing. Uh, United were lucky to get none. Newcastle were unfortunate to get one. It was a, a performance more than the result that needs looking at, and it was disastrous wasn't it that's what uh, our colleague Chris Weir said at full times me he said there's no disgrace in losing at Newcastle but the manner of the performance in itself warrants an inquest there was so much wrong about United you know, again and looking at these three away games uh, Everton Galatasaray Newcastle just there's no correlation as to how they they play you look at Tottenham in the last four games they've lost three and drawn one but they stick to their principles. They play the way they want to play. They were unfortunate to lose some of those games and they showed really um, admirable resilience to get, get a draw at City yesterday and they're, they're playing out of the back. It, it looks dicey, but it isn't. If United tried that, it would be worthy of note the way you know Tottenham try and play the ball out of the back because United can't do that. And uh, I think... Uh, coming back um, from the game or, or speaking to someone yesterday I said United can't press they can't keep the ball they struggle to defend they struggle to score goals and if if those are four problems in a the team they're not going to be doing well and the the press box at Newcastle as, as we both know it's, it's it's probably the best press box in the Premier League in terms of gleaning colour and seeing how things are developing away from the pitch and there were just so many worrying signs for United it felt like Ten Hag's authority eroded a little bit. Yeah, he seemed indecisive. I've never seen him quite as animated or exasperated. I mean, it was very cold. It was you know, advisable to to um, to be a bit more mobile on the touchline. Um, I mean, he kept his his flat cap on because it was it was minus temperatures. But when you see him having that exchange with Anthony Marshall and you see Marshall having the gall to give some back, fair enough. You you might not want to hook him straight away because you don't want to make a story out of it, but it seemed like he was going to come off at half time because Hoyland was warming up. Then he doesn't bring him off at half time, and then when he does bring him off, it's gone the hour mark, which is a bit it's a bit hackneyed, really. Uh, it's it's too predictable, and of course Newcastle have scored by that point, and they've settled into a pattern of play. The this, this defenders are quite comfortable operating the way they are. They know a striker who's coming on um, hasn't scored in the Premier League. I mean, they, these are not the biggest problems at, at United and, and United were, at least they did press a little bit towards the end and they they, they seemed a lot more um, functional with, remarkably, a left back at left back and the two forwards on the pitch who should have started the game. But talk about coming, you know, t- talk about aggressive steps over the last week in Istanbul with, with the goalkeeper and, you know, We'll get on to it. I mean, the, the only same grace for Anana up from the game on Saturday is that he's he's not the full guy in this fallout. We'll we'll get on to those those two shortly, I'm sure. But these are two clubs, Newcastle and, and Manchester United, going in opposite directions. Um, Newcastle, a, a well run. They've in terms of hierarchy, the sporting director Dan Ashworth is one of the best sporting directors going. Newcastle are quite have got quite a lot of injuries to contend with as United have as well but Newcastle still play the way they want to play the players know their cues uh, they feed off the crowd United the, the problem we're getting with Ten Hag at the moment as well is that we're asking him questions and we're not getting answers we're getting responses he has not got you know an enlightening answer as to why United are dreadful away from home the other week he was saying United are very good away from home we were both very sceptical about that they're not very good away from home. They're the same as last season. They've beaten the fodder away from home in the Premier League. They've lost at Newcastle. They've lost at Arsenal. They've lost at Tottenham. Three clubs who'll probably finish in the top six this season. United have still not won away at a top eight side since Solskjaer's last win in management. And two days after that, Nuno Espirito Santo was sacked by Tottenham. So even that has got an asterisk against it. 
I think as my intro said at the weekend, um, against the black and whites, Manchester United showed their true colours. Yeah, I, I mean, it's you mentioned the, the injuries there and looking better with a left back on. I mean, there was four right backs on the pitch at the start of the game and in Livramento playing. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, Newcastle had the first and second best right backs. The, the imbalance didn't affect them. Yeah. They were they looked better coached. They were hungrier. They were more aggressive. They were just better in in every single department. And I, I was saying on the way home, I don't I don't see how United intend to score goals at the moment unless it's a counter attack or a stroke of genius like from Fernandez in in midweek. And teams just aren't going to give them counter attacks. I mean, counter attacks are the preserve of mid table teams. Really, Manchester United shouldn't be looking to play on the counter attack really because you don't get that many opportunities to pull it off. And and they can't pull it off. And the you know the, the trends are frightening since that I mean since that Carabao Cup United have generally been poor they've played Newcastle three times now and lost six nil been comfortably comfortably second best in every single one of those games and and I mean the alarm bells are starting to ring pretty pretty loudly aren't they they are and Newcastle fans at the end of the game were delighted of course but. They weren't ecstatic because this is part of the core now. It's Man United come to town and Newcastle just you know, steamrolled them. Uh, they, they bully them, they beat them. And they're in United slipstream now. I know Newcastle have this thing on social media where there's always a, a celebratory picture in the dressing room after a win. United are not a scalp that, that merit that. It's, it's, become, it's become quite routine and, and simple and straightforward for Newcastle to beat United. It was just their misfortune that the one time they didn't was in the League Cup final where United were pretty professional that day and they did turn up and Newcastle eventually turned up but it was too late and that was one of the few occasions uh, this year where United managed a game well and their experience told and at the time they were. it seemed like they were in a good place. There was a gradual fall off towards the end of last season after that but they still got where they needed to be in, in the Premier League. And this season, it's just been a really, really stark regression. And you talk about Livermento there. He's played well against United um, twice within about 30-odd days as a right-back and as a left-back. That is someone who's been really well coached, who has been recruited um, with an eye on where he's going to play, how he's going to fit into the team, how quickly he will fit into the team. And Newcastle know what they're doing with recruitment. And they've done that pretty quickly within less than two years since the, the takeover by um, the, the, the Saudi PIF. So that, that they are proof that if you get things right very quickly, you can go a long way in quite a quick space of time as well. With United, you're looking at some of the players there and look at some of the selections last week. And it's they are throwbacks to a bygone era. You've got Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's back four. You've got Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's number nine. Stephen was saying to me last week, he was reminding me, oh, you don't like predictions, which I don't. And, and part of the reason is that more often than not, you don't know the team for definite. When that team dropped on Saturday night, I thought, I, I, I was worried for United. I thought, what, what is he playing at here? Why has he brought Rashford and Marshall back into the team? Anthony, when he has been underperforming this season, he kept on playing him. When he performs, he takes him out of the team. It's... It's a contradiction. That in itself is a contradiction, as it was his selection of Dallo at left back. This is a manager who has told us ad nauseum, I want left footers and right footers uh, in a back four. So two right footers, two left footers. Fair enough. And he puts Luke Shaw at left back, uh, sorry, centre back, which, you know, he, he did well, he did pretty well there, as he often does. But he's got a left back on loan from, from Tottenham who he, he's just not bothering with. And Okay, you want Wan Bissaka to take on Anthony Gordon. Normally, you'd say he's he's the best equipped to deal with him. But Wan Bissaka far post uh, dozes. Dallo was oblivious to where Kieran Trippier was. That in itself just kind of um, is, is United in a microcosm. There's a boyhood Mancunian United fan who wanted to join United a couple of years ago, who they could have had if they really did push the boat out for him. They didn't. And get Dallow's tied down a new contract earlier in the year. He's not even been entrusted to play at right back in the last couple of games from the start. So it, it's not. It wasn't the obvious main takeaway from the game, but just wherever you looked on that pitch, whether it was Anana's kick in, how he's gone to pot with his feet, never mind his hands. And it's it's really really difficult that if you if you 
if you select players in a team that are going to inhibit the way you play, and let's face it, United don't have a clear style of play, the chances are you're going to get beat. They did get beaten. And the only saving grace was that they weren't thrashed because it was a 1-0 thrashing. Yeah. I, I mean, we mentioned Shaw there. Like I say, he did well again at centre-back. Yeah. He is clearly a good centre-back. But the reason, it sent out all the tactical reasons for playing in there. The reason he always says for playing on left footer there is to help with build-up. There was no build-up. Anana just smashed every goal yeah. kick until the last 15 minutes or so when they were behind. It, and Anana, I mean, it wasn't a fault of the goal, but there were shaky moments in his performance again. And then you get, I, I thought it kind of, and I know there's injuries at the moment, but I'm not sure any of them really count for this. You've got, no. you, you're 10 minutes to go at Newcastle, and you're chasing the game and you bring on an on-loan left-back, an on-loan defensive midfielder, both signed on deadline day. I mean, Newcastle must have just looked at that, you know, his last roll of the dice and just thought, we'll be all right. We'll here. see this out. We'll be yeah. all right here. And, you know, I mean, Mason Mann could have been fit, could have come on. Would he have done anything? Doubtful. He's not done anything. This Sancho, arguably. Not really impacted games. I mean, this just, it just looked, all of a sudden it looks a thin squad. And that just, you know, that, that sums up the failings in the transfer market. You can maybe make an argument for Regulon being a, a, a decent short term signing, but now the managers are playing. I'm about really to look woefully out of his depth. It's just, it's just a mess, isn't it? Well, at the end of his press conference on Friday, uh, Simon Stone asked Ten Hag, will, will, Re- will Regulon stay? Uh, because his, his season. His season-long loan is, of course, as it says, for the season, but there's a break clause uh, so that he could go back to Tottenham in January because of, of Tyrone Molassia coming back. So United assumed that Molassia would be fit for the new year or be fit by now. And then on Friday, it was announced that he's, he's had a setback and requires a second round of surgery. It's the second time that's happened, which, again, you think, in terms of a, a club where a lot of things are going wrong, he's the second player who's required a second round of surgery after a, after a setback. So what the hell is going on? The medical staff after a new doctor came in, in, in Gary O'Driscoll. Um, it's, it's, wherever you look, it's just so so much to go at. It, you know, it doesn't... I don't think United are in crisis, but the more you think about it, the more you think, crikey, maybe they are. And uh, so Ten Hag was asked this question about Reggion, and he got up and he frowned. There was a, a pin to pause. He said, I, I don't understand. I'm thinking, well... You sh- surely you're aware that there's a break clause that Reggion could go back and if, if Malassia isn't going to be back until early next year which could be February, it could be March you're, you're probably going to have to keep Reggion as the, the reserve left back that time and, and sure obviously has, has missed a few months this season as well and the fact that the manager seems was, didn't, just didn't seem to know what a journalist was going on about it goes back to my earlier point that we're asking questions and we're not always getting answers and the point about Anrabat is getting to the point now where because he's not been signed as much and because of the, the way the midfield played on Saturday and how disjointed they were you think oh, maybe he needs to come back in against Chelsea but there's just no there's no clear I, I, I go back to that Newcastle League Cup game I thought that was an opportunity to put players in who you are going to entrust for at least until January on the off chance that you, you could get one or two players in provided one or two players go out and you try and you know put a style put your imprint back on the side and he's not really done that there are a couple of you know there are a couple of good prospects of course and Garnett and Cho and Maynou and Hoyland is you know, that there is potential there he's absolutely not the right profile of striking United should have gone for we said that in the summer the way things have panned out it's not not a surprise and I think I suspect that might have been Ten Hag's rationale behind starting Marshall in that he thinks, well, Marshall scored last week. He's he's actually scored in the Premier League and Hoyland hasn't. And that in itself is a problem because it feels like t- with Ten Hag at the current time, he's he's got this fixation on stats and stats do not give you the bigger picture. He mentioned this ridiculous stat about Anana being the second best goalkeeper in the Premier League on, on Friday um, because Marcus Rashford scored a penalty against Everton. It was a mercy penalty, let's face it, to get his confidence up. It was a calculated risk. He took it well. But his performance at Everton was was not good. And Anthony's performance against Galatasaray was good. And I get there's periodization with players, there's conditioning and freshness. And yes, you travel to Istanbul and you get back in the early hours of Thursday morning, you want freshness. But you can't just ignore how Rashford has played this season. And it goes back to my point in terms of 
it felt like Ten Hag's authority eroded a bit. Yeah, he's he, he's taking some very strong decisions with a few players. Uh, I mean, Ronaldo did the job for him in terms of forcing a divorce. De Gea, I don't think it was as ruthless as was made out. Sancho, he had to be bombed out after he didn't apologise for what he did. But the fact that he didn't act with greater alacrity with Marshall and that he started Marshall and that he started Rashford, Rashford's having his worst season ever so far and he's still not been dropped. The, as, as bad as some of these individuals have been performing, the manager has to take, has to be massively held to account with, with a lot of those selections. And that's all for part one of the Manchester is Red podcast. We'll be back after the break to analyse some of those selections and individual performances. Welcome back to the Manchester is Red podcast. Uh, Apologise for any external noise you may be able to hear, by the way. The, uh, the building work that was going on last week that we mentioned is still going on outside this office. You might be able to hear some, some drilling at the moment. Um, we're going to look at some individual performances from, from Newcastle now. I guess the obvious place to start is, is a person who dominated a lot of Ten Hag's post-match press conference, Marcus Rashford. I mean, United got better when Rashford went off and Anthony came on, and that probably just says it all, doesn't it? It does. That would that would be the succinct summary of it. He he should not have started that game. It's it's got so bad for him that Jermaine Genus is highlighting him and digging him out. And Genus did some puff piece of an interview with Rashford a few years ago for Men's Magazine, just because he's safe, because he's going to be friendly, because he's going to ask, uh, ask underarm questions. When a pundit like that is all of a sudden highlighting your, frankly, your laziness because he wasn't tracking back, he wasn't running enough, he wasn't busting at gut, then you are in a pretty, pretty dire position. It's getting to the point now with Rashford where there's obviously resale value there. If, as, as a friend said, season ticket holder said, if PSG get rid of Mbappe and they, st- they still want for Rashford, United have absolutely got to consider cashing in on him because there is an attitude problem there. His body language is appalling. It's been appalling all season. Uh, he has this inflated air of entitlement about him. There's a sense of entitlement there. He's been the golden boy at United. United have been enthralled to him um, through a number of different managers. And look, he's, he's, he's played well at different times under these different managers. He's broken the 20 goal barrier, I think, in, in three seasons. I mean, Michael Richards, who I don't think offers anything as a pundit, when Roy Keane and Jamie Carragher were having this discussion about Rashford yesterday, he said he's playing in a bad team. He was playing in a crack team three years ago under Solskjaer and he was playing really well. He was in, at that point, career best form and he was the talisman and when he had his back problem in January 2020 and was going to be sidelined for a few months, that was like almost end of day stuff for United because his, his form had been exceptional. So it's not an excuse. He's playing in a better team now. He's playing under a better manager. He was playing on the left wing. He was playing dreadfully there. I tell you, know, I tell you the point, at the start of the season, Ten Hag played him up front. It was a stupid decision. Everyone knows he's not a centre forward, but he only started two games there. And his third game, he assisted Eriksson's uh, first goal against Forest. He played a lovely ball for the equaliser that Casemiro put in and he won the penalty. Like, that's a progressive performance. Next game scores a good goal against Arsenal. And I think the first game back against Brighton, it was that game where he had about eight shots and none of them looked remotely close to going in. And his body language then we, was getting flagged. And like, this is a problem here. Like, you've got to cut that out. You're, you're turning 26 in a month's time and you're not, you're not a kid anymore. And this is a problem with Rashford. He does still act like a kid in terms of the way he, he plays. The first time he got the ball on Saturday, he tries to go on the dribble, he goes straight into a cul-de-sac. That keeps happening every every game this season. And nobody is is getting him, you know, is, is grabbing him by the by the scruff of the neck and saying, You need to, you know, you need to do something about this. You need to something needs to be jolted here. Ten Hag hasn't dropped him. That's not helped. I don't understand why Ten Hag hasn't dropped him because it should have happened last month. Obviously, he was injured for the Fulham game. He was suspended in Istanbul. Uh, he, he didn't start in the League Cup against Newcastle, but that was, a ro- that was rotational. A few players um, came out of the team for that game. He's not been outright dropped. And I think we saw 
that season under Solskjaer, he was playing really well. He didn't start the season very well and he was dropped by Gareth Southgate, I think, for an England defeat to the Czech Republic in the October. He came back into the team against Bulgaria, scored, United resumed their season and he got a goal against Liverpool and then he was on his way. That shows that if you drop a player, they can respond to it. I don't know why Ten Hag hasn't done that. He's clearly not had the faith in other players or there's been mitigation around it. But the more I watch Rashford at the moment, and I mean, Jamie Carragher really tore into him yesterday. He said, the worst thing I can say about him is that he's, he's like Marshall. And at the moment, you, you couldn't tell them apart in terms of body language or lack of work rate. It's, it, it is pretty startling to watch. There was, there was one ball over the top where, I mean, Wan-Bissaka won't walk about a lot of times on, on Saturday where Livermento was playing behind. And I'm watching the ball with Livermento at the corner of my eye, but I'm fixating on Rashford. And he wasn't even jogging back. There was no no urgency to get back whatsoever. And fans have been on his back already this season. They cheered him off when he was substituted in the derby. Hours later, he goes out and has a birthday party on, on Dean's Gate, which was just daft. Not that that's going to go down like a lead balloon. And I don't think he gets a... a a rougher ride because he's local and I think he's just getting a rough ride from supporters because he's he's performing like a drain and it's not look it's not a coincidence his form has gone downhill since he got a new contract he had he did tail off towards the end of last season but you look at him now and you have to question is he demotivated is his motivation a, a good salary because you see him on the football pitch, he doesn't look motivated. And United fans have, have quite rightly so, have been very quick to remind him that at the start of last season, his brother flew out to Paris to speak to Paris Saint-Germain. Now, that's going to obviously strengthen their, their bargaining hand and it's results in him getting a salary of more than 300 grand a week. So he can play the boyhood card all he likes. He can say he's from Withenshaw and how he came in the team and this is great. Like th those, th That is all great, but that's in the past. And you're judged on what you're doing, not what you've done. We were driving back from Newcastle and I had an uh, incoherent, uh, unhappy email from, from a player's relative over a player rating. I don't think you... I, I don't think it, it takes Hercule Poirot for United fans to guess who... Uh, that relative is, or of, of, of uh, who the re who that relative is uh, related to in terms of the players. Yeah, uh, I mean Rashford should have been the freshest player on that pitch. Given Newcastle picked the same team that had a really tough night in Milan on Tuesday, United had been in Istanbul while Rashford wasn't. He was suspended. Yeah, and like you say, there was very little effort to track Liverimento back. Wambasaka had a tough time because Anthony Gordon, who looked twice the player Rashford is at the moment not only had loads of joy against wan but he had Rimento as a support as well. And so often they had 2-1-1. One, one. The, there was the moment where Rashford had wan on the overlap and a simple pass just knocked it straight out of play, just turns on his heels, walks back. There's no apology. There's no sorry about that. There's nothing. Then he comes off and goes and sits on the bench. And, you know, he didn't disguise his disappointments at coming off. I... I I struggled to work out why he was surprised at coming off and he sat there on the bench muttering away, clearly unhappy, which he knows the cameras are going to pick out. Becomes a talking point afterwards, Paul Scholes taking him apart yeah. because of what we're seeing on the bench. Now, I mean, Ten Hag said after the game that he's he's going to talk to him about his form. But, I mean, given the way Garnaccio's playing on the left, there's been, I guess, signs of life from Anthony the last couple of games. I mean, now is surely the time that Rashford can't get in this team this week, can he? He... he he shouldn't have been getting in the team at Newcastle and Ten Hag still crowbarred him in and Ten Hag said on Friday, oh, Rashi likes playing on the right. He doesn't. We all know he doesn't. Uh, there's no point trying to uh, give some uh, you know, ridiculous rationale for, for getting him into the team. He, he doesn't like to play there. And you can imagine Rashford with his inflated sense of um, self-worth that he's thinking, why is some teenager playing in the position that I played in the last season, scoring 30 goals? Well, tough luck because he's the teenager. Garnacho has done a hell of a lot more on the left and he's merited this um, run of starts. He's scored a couple of goals. He was the only forward who 
threatened Nick Pope on, on Saturday. He had that opportunity quite early on in the game. He's he's done a hell of a lot more than Rashford has this season. And he's he's probably done better than decently for for this recent run because he's a 19 year old and he's not he's never started this number of matches in, in succession and he, he should continue to, to start there against um, against Chelsea on Wednesday and it's I mean when Rashford came into the team he was the whippersnapper to come in him and Marsh in fact were the whippersnappers in the team phasing Wayne Rooney out of out of the side and eventually out of United it's it feels a bit premature to take on actually coming in to do that to Rashford but Rashford is he's pretty much in the same position now that Rooney was in his last couple of seasons at United where there was just no justification for starting him he was on the wane uh, pun, pun intended there and eventually and quite belatedly as well it took Mourinho um, about six or seven games into his first season to realise that yeah I can't I can't pick him there's, there's, he, he has to go we've got better players players who are more suited to to what we want to do with um, with, with with this side and less than a year later Rooney's, Rooney's out of the club now it's a very different set of circumstances for Rashford because he's he's not in his early 30s He's in his he's pretty much he's approaching his late twenties now, but I still think the point stands that United, unless there's a, a drastic improvement, they've they've got to keep options open next summer with Mbappe uh, likely to to leave PSG and PSG have not concealed their admiration for Rashford and Rashford's brother brazenly um, went out to Paris to to hold discussions with them and that that. That that ensures things like that. That supporters don't forget it, and you lose goodwill with um, with supporters when things start going wrong. And they have been supportive at times this season. But as Keen said, United fans don't dig out individuals lightly. It, it takes a really you know really egregious performance level for them to um, to audibly turn on a player. And there have been a few this season and. It's not a surprise that Rashford and Marshall have been a couple of them. Yeah. I guess the other area to talk about is midfield. Um, I mean, I thought Cabrera had a, another respectable night in, in difficult circumstances. There's injuries, obviously, at the moment, but target has got nine midfielders to, to choose from, but he's yet to find a combination this season that isn't being outrun, outthought, outfought by the opposition. You know, We said driving home that if you were an opposition analyst or coach or player at the moment, you would look at that United team and think, these, these are going to be fun to play against because yeah. you can get at them. Yeah. They're conceding an astonishing number of shots and it feels like so many of the problems come back to midfield because they've barely won a midfield battle all season despite Ten Hag signing four midfielders and having so many to, to choose from. And it's, it, it, is it becoming what, more... What was the stat you said about how many shots they can season? It was 60, 62, I think, maybe. It was 24 to Everton, 22 to Newcastle. So that's 46. And I think it was 16 to Galatasaray. So yeah, 62 shots in three away games. I mean, that's about one every three minutes, I think. My quick maths. We'll give it four minutes maybe with injury time, but it's still not great. Yeah. But they're, they're, they're a soft touch, aren't they? They're easy to play against. Yeah. and. On paper, the midfield's looking okay, but whether it's just men being caught the wrong side of the ball, it's just... Well, he hasn't found a combination this season that can stem the tide, has he? And I don't really know where he turns from here in midfield. I think the, possibly the most alarming thing of it is that when you saw the midfield that he picked at Newcastle, you thought, okay, fair enough. I mean, I take umbrage with Dallow at left-back, I take umbrage with Marsh in the team, Rashford in the team, but the midfield, McTominay, Mano, you think, fine, okay, like, there's, you can't... And Rabat, would you have brought him in? He's what's he done to to, to merit a recall? Um, although he, he started in, in in Istanbul, but a Premier League recall. But the bigger picture is that that midfield is not sustainable. Kobe Mado, absolutely, you want to continue to develop him and give him opportunities. But he he's got to have help from the senior players. Fernandez is often an easy target. I don't think he was he came close to being any of the four guys from. The game at, at Newcastle, and you know, he has that added responsibility as captain. But McTominay at times has got to realise that he, as a senior player, he has to make adjustments to help a youngster bed in with him. But 
at Everton with that midfield. Everton had, you know, they, they were not exactly shot shy. They were, they were the opposite. Um, they had so many chances in the first half. They should have been level at half time. And Ten Hag seems, he seems to be ignoring the fact that, for someone ironically who seems fixated on stats at the moment, that they are conceding a lot of attempts at goal. But he's not changing the personnel enough in front of Anana to try and limit that. I mean. Varane, he's clearly got a down on at the moment, but Varane has been around the block. He's an organiser, he's a winner, he's a communicator. Like, if, if you're prepared to play Dallo at left back, you've got to be prepared to play Varane and Maguire as centre halves with Shaw at left back. You, you, th- those are your three. Th- those are your three best defenders probably available to you. So why not? Why not play them? Maybe that will limit the opportunities for the opposition. But really, I don't know where he goes from here in terms of the midfield because, I mean, Casemiro has not been... He's performing really badly this season, but he's, he's out of the picture at the moment. He's injured. Mount is injured. Mount's not done anything. Amrabat, already you, you're looking... You might want to check the paperwork because there break clause to t- send him back to Fiorentina in January. There's, there's not an obvious solution there. They're going to go around in circles... Um, possibly for the rest of the season. It's, it's very, very difficult to see on the personnel he, he settles on. And maybe coming up against Chelsea, he just thinks, well, I'm, I'm going to have to just keep it as it is and just hope that there's there's an improvement in the, the overall performance and that, that, that helps out the midfielders and we have a bit more of the ball and Chelsea can be quite chaotic and maybe it's just, you know, it's, it's chaos meets chaos and... Possibly United will, will prevail in that in those circumstances, but I don't know the solution there at the moment in midfield. Um, McTominay has done decently this season, especially given his, his starting point, where the, the club were more than open to selling him in the summer. Um, Maynu, I think, in time could have a transformative effect on on this team. I think he'll be integral to how United play under this manager if he ever gets to that point and, and the next manager whenever that will be I think you've, you've got to prioritise um, his, his, his standing in that squad but even when all the midfielders do come back from, from injury I, I'm struggling to see what the, the right the right personnel is what the right combination is I think in that Real Madrid game in Houston during pre-season um, it was Fernandes on the right mount behind the striker and uh, Casemiro and Maynou but you know that Ten Hag was looking to trial that and it only lasts a few minutes because of Maynou's injury unfortunately this is not the time of the season and there's not going to be a time for the rest of the season to trial uh, combinations because it's it's cutthroat time already they've got I mean this time next week they're going to be preparing for uh, a make or break night in the Champions League where they could be in the round of 16 they could be consigned to Europa League purgatory or they could just end, bo- end the group bottom which is where they spent most of their time in group A um, it's, it's going to be an eventful night to say the least then you've got Liverpool on a Sunday then it's West Ham a couple of days before Christmas these are not games um, Boxing Day Aston Villa at home that that has the potential to be a real bad one for United the way Villa are playing they're doing really well Villa there's there's no moment to, to experiment and as I said, I, I just, I, I don't know what the right combination is. Ten Hag certainly doesn't know what the right combination is. I think you, how many, how many midfield combinations have they had this season? I think you said. Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. Uh, a lot, though, I would say. Casemiro, Erickson, Casemiro, McTominay, that Casemiro, Mount, Mainu, McTominay, McTominay, Amrabat. Uh, Amrabat must have started in midfield with, with I think, with Mount, maybe, at one yeah. point. You, you... It's close to double figures. Yeah, yeah. That is a that's a huge, huge problem. Yeah, yeah. There's no there's no obvious solution, is there? I mean maybe Casemiro Mainu would, would would work, but we're not gonna see it for a while and then it's what do you do with your sixty million pound Mason Mount. But that'll be a problem for the new year. Uh we'll have to talk for part two of the Manchester Red podcast. We'll be back after this to talk about Chelsea. Welcome back to the Manchester is Red podcast. We're going to look ahead to Chelsea on Wednesday night. Uh, now, we mentioned shots in, in part two there. 
and we saw the, the stat doing the rounds that I'm sure a lot of a lot of listeners will have seen on Saturday night that only Luton and Sheffield United have had more shots against them this season than than Manchester United, which is a, a frightening statistic. And I think you could possibly say there's there's a, a top eight or, or a likely top eight this season maybe they're going to compete for European places in Arsenal, Liverpool, City, Villa, Tottenham, Newcastle, and then maybe Chelsea get get into that with Manchester United, and that's the, the top eight. Chelsea are improving. Brighton, yeah, yeah, maybe a top nine in that instance. Yeah, so there's eight teams there that United are competing against, should we say, for six or seven European places, seven seven probably European places. So far, played five, lost five, scored two, conceded twelve. Uh, they've got Chelsea, Liverpool and Villa in the next, what would it be, 20 days on Wednesday? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Ten, ten Hag dare not lose all three of them or even not win them because, like we say, if Jim Ratcliffe and Ineos come in in January and United have played eight, lost eight against the, the top eight or nine, I mean, that could be a, a serious problem for him. He needs to win. And if we're almost parking Liverpool as saying borderline unwinnable the way this team are playing... Yeah. They've got to beat. They've got to beat Chelsea and Villa, really, and or at least get a win and a positive result against one of them because they need to prove they can compete with these teams rather than being the ninth or tenth best team in this league. I mean, you're talking about Chelsea. I'm not particularly confident United will beat Bournemouth on on Saturday at, at Old Trafford. I mean, they've made very hard work of it against Luton and Bournemouth. Uh, you know, they, they were close to beating Villa at, at home yesterday. They've picked up a little bit of form when the manager seemed to be yeah. under threat there. But they've, they've, as I said, they've uh, they're in a, a healthier position now. And uh, I think by virtue of the teams below them, they'll they might stay in the Premier League again next season. The the, the attempts conceded stat is all the more uh, disconcerting for United in that Sheffield United and Luton are two of the most ill-equipped teams to go into the top flight in, in living memory. Uh, I think Sheffield United are absolute certainties for relegation. Their manager, Paul Hagenpottom, is probably the one who, I mean, he's he's got to still be the favourite to be sacked, but somehow he hasn't been because I think there's an acceptance of the issues at the club and they were probably ahead of schedule in, in terms of getting promoted and, and Luton's promotion was, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great story, was a great story and, I think they've exceeded expectations and the points they've got this season. So for United to be bracketed with those teams, and as a friend who was at St James's Park on um, Saturday said, they've in the Premier League you've got City, Liverpool, and Arsenal. I think it's fair to say given their top and they finished second last season as the top tier of clubs. In the next tier of clubs you've got Newcastle, uh, Tottenham, Villa, probably Brighton in terms of the way they're running. Well-run clubs, good coaches, um, watchable styles of play, making progressive strides. And then United are in this next tier, probably just maybe them and Chelsea because they're two quite dysfunctional clubs. And that tier, you're looking at nine on mid-table. And this is the danger with United now. They are in danger of becoming a mid-table team. And this record away from home against top eight sides, which I touched upon earlier, that is the record of a mid-table side. They, I, I wouldn't say they punched above their weight in finishing third last season because they spent a hell of a lot of money assembling a squad that would give them a chance of getting back into the Champions League, and they did, and they had a successful season. But now you've got people talking about the possibility of Aston Villa and Brighton finishing above United and it not raising eyebrows. And those teams are doing very, very well. It's not to take not to take away the credit that those those clubs deserve. They've made very good decisions at uh, managerial and recruitment level. I mean, Villa got a hell of an upgrade going from Steven Gerrard to Unai Emery, and look, Unai Emery is very good for a profile of like, club that is, yeah, mid middle of the top half of the table really. Like Villarreal have been, and Sevilla have been in Spain, and Villa. Yeah, certainly when I was growing up, Villa were one of those teams who'd be finishing fifth or sixth or seventh, normally always in the top half of the table. But for United, again, it was bad enough being bracketed with Luton and Sheffield United, but United getting bracketed with these clubs where it's getting to the point that you're not even looking at them as Champions League contenders. And now that's not the case because they've not been cut adrift 
in terms of top four, top five, um, this this whole thing of we either win or we lose and avoiding draws, that has worked in their favour in, in terms of you know, other teams have, have drawn games. I mean, City have drawn, I think, their last three games and weirdly United are six or seven points behind them. I think they're six points behind City. So um, it's, it's a strange, strange season in a lot of ways because United have had a number of crises to... Um, to contend with and there could be there could be another round the corner it's got the makings of it after that performance level at the weekend but we are we're approaching this period of three home games and um, as I said in my piece this morning I was I thought it was quite admirable the away support at, at Newcastle they were pretty defined towards the end and um, you know, supportive I didn't really hear any mutinous chants or mutinous cries um, or, or cheers when Rashford and, and Marshall went off uh, but at Old Trafford they have been mutinous this season there's been a lot of booing at Old Trafford this season they have uh, got on the back of got on Rashford's back they've cheered when Marshall's been substituted as well so this period of the next seven or eight days, like this period of you know, three three away games in six days, we're coming to these like micro micro periods where it's got the potential to get ugly for United. It didn't with the Everton, Galatasaray, Newcastle ones because they won one, drew one, they lost one. I mean, it was ugly on Saturday. The performance was, and now that's set us up for three difficult home games, difficult to different extents where they could be in a hell of a lot of bother again. Yeah, and I mean, a tip of the hat to any fans who did all three of those aways in, in six days. Um, you know, worth pointing out that Steve McLaren had to tell some of those United players to go and clap the away end on, on Saturday, which is uh, pathetic, really. And I mean, it's, it says a lot that we're talking there about Bournemouth and obviously we'll be back on Friday to preview Bournemouth in greater detail, but we're already thinking that's a banana skin for, for this Manchester United side. and. That's that's just the way it is at the moment, and and they are they are like we say they're they're not in crisis at the moment, but the next three weeks could easily tip them into to that position. It, I feel like it's potentially a, a defining three weeks in, I could say Ten Hag's reign, but maybe we're approaching the point already in how long he actually survives. Um, and, and like I say, if those three results go against them, then it, I think it could be really problematic for him in January. Looking at the Chelsea game, then what do you do with the? The team selection. I'm, I'm going to guess there's at least two changes you're going to make in attack. Um, well, what else? What else do? What else would you do? What do you think Ten Hag might do going into to Wednesday night? Christ, I don't know what he would do because that that team. The the other problem that team on Saturday was that it was unpredictable. I think you could put that as a competition to United fans. What team will Ten Hag pick? And every season ticket holder could have submitted a team, and it wouldn't have been that team that lined up. Um, at, at Newcastle that was one of the big problems with, with the way they performed and sometimes unpredictability it can be good but I think we both had a sense as soon as that team dropped that this this is not good you, you are blunting your attack with two players who as they demonstrated on, on Saturday have, have a problem with with running at the moment which is if as, as a as an athlete, as a footballer, that's, that's a big problem if you've got them on the team. And it, it really was like playing with nine men at times for United. I mean, they were getting overrun and no no surprise really with Marsh and Rashford perform the way they, they did. I mean, Ten Hag's press conference tomorrow is going to be Rashford heavy. There will be a, a big Marshall element to it as well, I'd imagine, not just because of the way they play, but because of the number of pundits already that have gone to town on them. Uh, Scholes, Carragher, Keane, uh, Genus did it at half time as well. I'm not too sure what Rio Ferdinand said, uh, but he was at St James's Park as well. So, really high profile pundits for the rights holders with some very, yeah, um, you know, some nice singers as well. I think, what was it, Roy King said, you know, Marshall, we forgive him. He scores about one goal every 14 years. And that wasn't his best this season. That was after Tottenham when he said, when you're bringing Marshall on, you might as well bring on Frank Stapleton or, or Norman Whiteside. And again, Ten Hag is still playing him three three months later. So if, if those two are starting, then I, mean, I think there'll be a few sighs in, in Old Trafford and it won't be sighs of relief, it'll be sighs of exasperation. The, the front four really, it, it's got to be Garnacho, Hoyland, Fernandez, Anthony. Uh, it's, I think anything else would just be completely illogical. 
midfield wise, as I said, it's 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 maybe a clash of the chaos with with Chelsea because it, the, their games have descended into that. They've had some very watchable matches this season: the, the Liverpool two two, the City four four. Um, so I I half wonder whether you just you keep your powder dry with McTominay and Maynou, but it really wouldn't surprise me if if if, if Ten Hag does resort to Amrabat because they, it did seem like there was a bit more stability with with him on the pitch, be it the context of the games that yeah, Newcastle decided, let, let's just see the game out now and we're confident that this team that can't score goals in, in the Premier League will not score against us. I mean, I, I've, I, I've forgot to check, but ha, what, what's United's goal? Like Their goals fall now in the Premier League. It's got to be... Well, United have scored 16 and conceded 17. So how many games is that now? 14. 14, yeah. And, and that was... Yeah, by virtue of them scoring three at Everton, that's kind of like ensure that they're not averaging just they're averaging a little bit more than a goal per game. But that result in terms of the score line still feels like an anomaly. Uh, d- defensively, he he abs- I I've been picking Varane in my team, like our personal panel elevens going into games for a few games. So just because I think like he's he's fit, he's. If you talk about freshness and bringing Rashford in because he was fresh. Why? Why not bring in the, the 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 probably the best defender at the club on his day? I know he's not had a good season, and the last time he played, it was a walking disaster in Copenhagen. But you've got to take measures to limit what's going on in in front of Anana um, and in front of that defence, because as well as Shaw has played since he returned, as well as Maguire has been playing, United are really really porous. Um, they are not a good defensive unit this season. I mean, they, they had the most clean sheets in the Premier League last season. They're not going to win that award this season. So I'd I'd be looking at probably a, certainly a few adjustments to that team. The, the strange thing is maybe um, the advisable thing to do is to, is to make fewer changes than the number of changes made um, at Newcastle. I thought that was part of the problem that one, the team was unpredictable and four changes just seemed a bit excessive um, from from the Galatasaray game, and that 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 team was a classic case of manager overthinking it. And sometimes you've just got to take a step back and think that who our potential match winner is going to be, who are the t- players who are going to make us tick tonight. I mean, the thing with Anthony as well, like if you him against Newcastle, he was one of the few who had anything about him at St James's Park last season. And of course, he had a. I think gave Dan Byrne a bit of the runaround in, in the League Cup final as well. So why, and particularly given that he played well in in Istanbul, it made it particularly odd that he wasn't playing on on Saturday. Yeah, needless to say, I would be picking the same front four. Uh, that is all for today's Manchester Red podcast. Uh, we'll be at Old Trafford on Wednesday to bring you everything from what could be another chaotic game in a pretty chaotic season. And then we'll be back on Friday with another podcast dissecting events from the Chelsea game and looking ahead to Bournemouth and what we're already predicting to be another banana skin. That's all for now.